Hello, everyone, and welcome to AISC's webinar, Blast Resistant Design of Steel Buildings. This is part one, Blast Loads and Their Interactions with Buildings, presented by Kirk Marchand. Today is March 17, 2016. My name is Christina Harbour, and I'm with AISC's Continuing Education Group, and I'll be moderating today's presentation. I want to introduce today's speaker. Kirk Marchand is Managing Principal at Protection Engineering Consultants, with over 35 years of experience in fields related to the response of structures and mechanical systems to severe transient loads. Kirk has performed research and managed small and large scale projects in facility and building security, blast resistant design and analysis, threat assessment and vulnerability analysis, and security engineering for government agencies and commercial enterprises. His experience includes design, analysis, and detailing of steel components and structural systems. Kirk has held key leadership positions at Walter, excuse me, Walter P. Moore, Applied Research Associates, and Southwest Research Institute. A graduate of Texas A&M University, he began his career as an active duty U.S. Army Corps of Engineers officer and research engineer. Welcome, Kirk. I will hand things over to you. Thank you, Christina, and uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, work with AISC to present uh, today's webinar and seminar. I'm uh, the first of a tag team, Aldo McKay, um, who I work with here at PEC, will be presenting uh, part two, and uh, we're going to divide and conquer. I'm going to uh, talk about blast loads and, and their interaction uh, with buildings. Aldo is going to get into the details of calculating uh, response uh, due to blast loads um, and methods uh, that are available out there to do that. I'm the better looking one on the left, uh, Aldo is the younger and wiser uh, one on the right there. And what we're going to talk about today is is really um, an introduction and an overview. Uh, there's a lot of um, rabbit trails we could go down um, uh, that are related to uh, the prediction of blast loads, the type of blast loads, uh, the type of energy release that produces a blast load. But we will be covering uh, the, the basic uh, approaches to basically determine loads. The two-part uh, webinar is uh, loads is part one and response is part two. And so you should walk away from this with the ability to um, calculate blast loads uh, given some fairly straightforward scenarios associated with high explosives. But you'll also have a more general knowledge of the nuances of that and where you could get into trouble if you um, always assume that the simplifications we talk about today are correct. Um, well, at the at the end, we'll talk a little bit about computation using some tools. There's a variety of methods that are out there. Uh, there's some empirically derived charts that have been incorporated into simple software tools. There's some engineering methods, uh, and there's some numerical um, methods that are available to calculate blast loads. We'll we'll briefly cover those. We'll we'll focus a little bit more on the empirically derived uh, approach uh, that's captured in one of the software programs called ConWeb uh, at the end. But, but again, it will give you the ability to go away from this and, uh, and calculate uh, pressures and impulses, which will describe how important they are here shortly. All right, first of all, the definition of an explosion. It, it basically is a sudden and violent release of mechanical, chemical, or nuclear energy um, usually accompanied with a generation of high temperature and the release of gases. Uh, in the sense that we're going to talk about today, it's essentially the product of a runaway exothermic chemical reaction uh, where the heat of reaction equals uh, the heat of combustion. As Baker, Bill Baker described it in his 1983 book, and there's, that's one of the references that we'll point out at the end of this presentation that provides a uh, really good overview uh, of uh, blast loads and blast hazards. There are four general categories of explosives. Um, there are uh, unstable explosives, uh, 
what we sometimes call laboratory curiosities, nitrogen trichloride, some organic peroxides. These are things that um, uh, folks find out are explosives by accidentally mixing things together that they shouldn't mix together. And there is, um, again, that exothermic reaction that occurs. Uh, what we're going to really focus on today are primary explosives, uh, high explosives, or secondary explosives, and other things like propellants. Um, primary explosives are typically used for initiation of high explosives. They're boosters or initiators. Um, they tend to be more sensitive. They also tend to be more energetic, things like lead azide. Um, but they're used in detonators and boosters for uh, larger amounts of what are called high explosives or secondary explosives, or HE. Those uh, explosives include things like TNT, RDX, uh, composition C4, penalite. These materials uh, are the workhorses of explosive engineering. They can be handled safely. They generally can be stored uh, for long period, periods of time. Um, they can be reliably initiated. Uh, and they also perform reliably in that if properly initiated and boosted, uh, they perform as high explosives and produce the shock that is expected to uh, perform the work. And we'll talk a little bit today about good uses of explosive. For the most part, if you're designing a building to resist an explosion, um, typically you're not doing that because it's a deliberate expl uh, or uh, You're not doing it because... Uh, uh, it's something that you expect to encounter over and over unless you're doing a control room or something. Um, it's either an accidental explosion or a deliberate explosion by a terrorist attack or something like that. Um, the last category, propellants, that could include black powder, um, fuels. Uh, generally, this is the category of things that could detonate, but generally they are fuels that, um, in the case of of propellants and rocket fuel um, are designed to burn at a certain rate without detonating, um, but they can also be gas mixtures and fuels that if burned in the wrong environment, uh, the flame front can accelerate up to the point where uh, you could get a detonation. So those are four categories. The first one we're going to talk about um, is and focus on uh, are high explosives. Uh, the others that you may encounter in the process of, of designing uh, buildings would be things like vapor cloud explosions. Those are typically liquid or gaseous releases that provide that combustible material or fuel that we talked about and given the right conditions um, can accelerate to a detonation. We'll talk about uh, pressure vessel explosions, a couple different types of those, and then some other sources of high uh, uh, rate energy releases that could generate an air shock that uh, might be of interest in designing a steel structure. So we'll talk a little bit about what goes on inside an explosive. Um, basically, uh, detonation is a rapid and stable chemical reaction. It moves to the explosive from the point of initiation at supersonic velocity, so it's basically a shock velocity inside that solid explosive material. Uh, the velocity of that shock front is typically around 22,000, 29,000 feet per second for most high explosives, although it can range from, say, 13,000 uh, to above 30,000 feet per second, depending on the type of material. So you're basically starting at the point of initiation, and that's the, uh, the little point in the, the center here. I'll use this green arrow off and on during the webinar today. Uh, in this case, this is assumed to be a sphere, um, so that detonation front moves outward, and, and this is the boundary between the gaseous products in the middle and the unreacted material out in front. And so that detonation fr uh, uh, front moves through that material, reacts the material, gets to the outer edge or the high explosive boundary. All of that energy is then converted, uh, or a majority of that energy in, in the cases we're going to talk about today, is converted to uh, air shock, light, and heat. Uh, 
And of course, what we're mostly uh, concerned about is air blast or air shock. So that boundary is called the detonation front. It causes a change, fa fa uh, a change in phase in the material. And it reaches that outer boundary. Um, at that point, um, the energy is converted to air blast. And that is typically for a high explosive in the form of a shock. And again, that's a supersonic uh, wave that moves through the air. And that's what produces uh, the blast, the transient event, pressure time event that we're worried about for our explosives. I'm going to show a video in just a minute. But as that shock front moves through air because of the density difference in front of and behind uh, that air shock, uh, you'll, you'll actually see the shock wave move through the air. So I'll play this video. So from right to left, you'll see the shock front uh, working its way across. It interacts with uh, that simulated bridge pier in this case and the reaction structure that's holding it. And I will go back and play this one more time for you so you can watch it. Uh, again, from right to left, you'll see the flash. Then you'll see the, the, the dark line there that's moving and interacting and changing shape as it interacts with the structures in its path. And that's the air blast front. That's the shock front and air that we're going to talk more about today. And that's the instantaneous pressure rise that uh, typically is, uh, accompanies that that shock front. So uh, some common misconceptions about HE detonation, um, that shock is like a wind and the flow can be redirected. To some extent that's true. Um, you can have uh, things like blast walls uh, that can be placed very near explosives. Obviously they would have to be designed so that they could sustain the explosion. And for a short distance behind those blast walls, you actually will be provided some protection from uh, the reflected air shock uh, that's generated by the blast. But because it is, is a shock and it's expanding shock, uh, very shortly or a short distance behind that wall, the, the shock will recombine and you will have an environment that's not dissimilar to what you would have if the blast wall was not there at all. So limited application uh, in terms of redirecting it. Um, the shock moves faster than the wave speed of air particles. That's the definition of a shock. Uh, it doesn't travel uh, with sound. Uh, one of the coolest experiences that I had as a young lieutenant in the Army was watching some nuclear simulation tests uh, where a very large tens of thousands of pounds of explosives were detonated. And I was standing at a, at a safe distance away, and uh, uh, I saw a flash, and uh, it seemed like a few seconds later, um, I felt a ground shock, and shortly thereafter, I heard a sound. So depending on the geology, um, you may or may not uh, feel that earth shock before, but uh, you're definitely uh, going to feel the air shock uh, after you see that flash first. It travels a great distances, um, but the air itself is only displaced um, a small amount. We'll talk about negative phase blast where the atmosphere around the explosive uh, has to recover behind the shock wave. Um, an analogy very simple is that shock is a thousand uh, PSI gorilla that leans on your structure for a few milliseconds and then wanders off. Um, a lot of people over the years um, ask the question, can I just convert this air blast you know, pressure time history to an equivalent static load? There are ways to do that, but not uh, in a way that does not involve a very sophisticated calculation of the interaction of the shock with the structure. So it's a dynamic load. It's a transient load, um, not easily converted to an equivalent um, uh, seismic or an equivalent uh, static load. All right, um, that's a little bit of background of, on high explosives. Let's talk about vapor cloud explosions or the release of hazardous materials or fuels um, and how those can be the sources of explosive loads. Um, that could come about um, because of the accidental release of uh, flammable chemicals or fuels. Um, you may have uh, large storage vessels at an industrial site piping. It could be as simple as a bottle dock where you've got uh, propane bottles, acetylene bottles that are used for uh, fueling processes or, or uh, 
uh, mechanical cutting, those kinds of things. If that material is released and mixes with the oxygen, uh, which is the oxidizer for a combustion, and that combination of air and fuel uh, is within <coughs> the flammability limits, and more importantly, if it reaches a stoichiometric mix, which is an optimal mix, um, uh, and there's an ignition source, uh, you'll have a fire. If that flame front in that material encounters obstacles, it will accelerate. At some point, that flame front can accelerate to the point where you get a detonation, and that's kind of the definition of a vapor cloud explosion, where you actually have a vapor that starts as a, as a combustion and, and uh, 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 works its way up to a detonation. But, like I said, you've got to have an ignition source. It, it's not self-combusting. Um, you have to have acceleration, which means you have to have obstructions, um, generally speaking, for that vapor cloud to actually detonate. Um, but you can also predict, and there are methods in the literature um, and in, in some of the in both engineering and certainly the computational fluid dynamics codes to uh, calculate the uh, blast pressure that's produced as a function of the confinement and congestion uh, and in industrial processes, you can imagine, there's if you have one pipe break, there's a lot of other pipes around there that provide those obstructions. Uh, buildings can also provide confinement and obstruction. Um, flames that are are uh, uh, not quite reaching detonation, uh, typically that's the definition of a deflagration. It's uh, something that is more than a controlled burn, uh, but it's not quite a, a detonation. Uh, vapor cloud explosion modeling, there are several ways to do that. Um, there's a TNT equivalent method where uh, you can actually use some of the methods we'll talk about later in the webinar today if you convert the energy available in that vapor cloud explosion at that stoichiometric mix to an equivalent uh, weight of TNT. So that is one way to do it. It's not uh, very accurate. Um, it, it can be accurate at some standoffs or some scaled standoffs. Um, we'll talk about what that means, but some particular standoffs associated with a particular weight of explosive. But uh, the TNT methods, um, because of the pressure decay that's assumed as part of those air shocks, don't really represent the longer duration, typically longer duration event that a vapor cloud explosion um, uh, is. Uh, so uh, TNT is a way to do it, not the best way to do it. Um, there are vapor cloud explosion blast curves. Uh, we use those fairly routinely. They're fairly simple to use. Um, uh, they account for the fact um, that you uh, have a material that is going to provide that longer duration uh, event. They also account for the fact that there can be various strengths in uh, the explosion. Again, it's that deflagration to detonation transition, uh, there are some methods out there that as a function of the obstructions in the near field of the release and combustion will determine the strength of that explosion and predict uh, pressures and impulses. And that these are methods that are they're fairly, fairly well accepted, um, fairly easy to use from an engineering design standpoint, uh, and fairly uh, readily available. There are also fairly sophisticated numerical models and uh, codes that um, are typically called CFD codes for computational fluid dynamics codes. These often include um, release and dispersion. In other words, um, if a pipe fails, uh, there's a particular opening uh, that you happen. It might be a split in the pipe. It might be a penetration from, uh, say, a tornado-borne piece of debris. Um, so there is a spray or a release, or in the case of uh, a liquid, a pooling that occurs. So some of these models include those, um, the physics of those, the mechanics of those. Um, they also sometimes include dispersion. As you can imagine, that stoichiometric mix and the concentration of the material between those flammability uh, limits depends a lot on the atmosphere, the wind that day, the temperature that day. Um, and so the dispersion models will account for that and will tell you at what point you have a certain amount of material that's available for combustion or detonation. Um, the CFD models often and, and routinely include uh, reaction kinetics where 
they actually calculate that frame uh, flame front as as it progresses. I'll show you a movie, uh, and this just gives you a sense of um, how when you have a release and a reaction of a fuel or a combustible vapor uh, within a complicated structure, how all of those uh, uh, obstructions that are just part of the normal structural system uh, will contribute uh, to the reaction of that explosive. So. Uh, I'll play this just a few times, um, back it up, play it again, and you can see uh, the pressures propagate throughout the structure uh, and um, the pressure increase as it encounters obstructions and the flame front increases in speed. This would be example, for example of an offshore uh, platform where you have an accidental release of a, of a fuel or a vapor. Another source of explosion that uh, can be encountered fairly routinely in industrial settings are uh, pressure, pressure vessel explosions. And these are different from vapor cloud explosions in that a pressure vessel may simply um, be holding an inert gas, um, nitrogen for example, under high pressure uh, for the use in uh, a manufacturing process um, that uh, given a catastrophic venting of that high pressure will produce air blast or an air shock. Um, there are methods in the literature to predict that. Um, you can have this type of event uh, for both um, uh, non-reactive gaseous content, so it's basically a mechanical explosion as I just said, but you can also have um, reactive material inside uh, of there, which uh, now you're releasing a reactive material under pressure that, given an ignition source, can ignite. So you can have a combination of a release and a vapor cloud explosion. You can have also what's called a blevy, and that's where you have uh, pressurized flammable uh, liquid uh, that flashes to gas immediately upon uh, the catastrophic failure of the vessel. So uh, several different ways, and again, there are methods in the literature to, um, uh, in, a, in a closed form way, calculate uh, the resulting um, air blast from these type of events. There are some other sources of explosions that uh, you may encounter. Um, one is dust. Um, fine, uh, a, a, uh, an explosion after all is, is uh, an exothermic reaction uh, of um, typically carbon-based materials. Um, uh, grain storage elevators, uh, things like that. Uh, there's, a, there's a history of accidents with those when um, improperly vented um, so that dust can accumulate in a cloud and again given an ignition source that dust can burn to the point where the flame front um, transitions from a deflagration to a detonation. Uh, steam explosions. You can have a sudden mix of two streams of widely differing temperatures. So water into hot oil, that's a familiar uh, uh, um, kitchen type event. Um, water into molten metal, which I'll show you uh, a video of in a minute and how dramatic that can be. Um, lightning st striking a, a tree. Um, often we, we think of that as the lightning somehow mechanically um, causing the tree to explode. What's really going on there is that um, uh, the static charge that's going down through that tree actually converts all the moisture in the tree to steam and it's that steam explosion that causes the, the tree to explode. Um, electrical arc explosions, another, another type of explosion uh, where you have what's called arc flash uh, and, and that can rapidly uh, vaporize metal uh, and insulation material. Um, it can have significant force. Uh, a common incandescent light bulb has a uh, has fusing in it such that when the filament burns out you don't have arc flash that would um, without that simple fusing could cause the uh, uh, glass in the bulb to actually explode just because the filament burned out. 
So I've got a pretty cool video here that uh, is a steam explosion. Let me set this up a little bit. I'll start it because I think it's kind of long to to watch. But but this is a ladle of molten metal in a in a steel plant, which many of you are familiar with. Uh, there's a guy back towards uh, your viewing position that's standing there behind the operator pul uh, pulpit. Um, the operator the ladle is now raising it, and you'll see a water bottle come flying in. I believe from the right side that'll that'll hit the ladle in a minute. Just about now, I think. There it goes. And the conversion of those few ounces of water um, to steam instantly in that um, molten metal uh, will actually create a blast wave. And so we've worked with um, some uh, steel manufacturing companies to refine uh, their approach for designing their pulpits, uh, operator pulpits, and their control rooms to account for these steel, uh, steam explosions. And the reason that's of interest um, up there, we don't have this problem so much in Texas, but up there where many of you live, uh, where they're taking scrap steel in for the winter t uh, in the winter time and and uh, melting it down, uh, there could be pockets of ice um, uh, in there, and if you suddenly uh, drop a piece of scrap in there that's got a large amount of, of uh, ice or water hidden in it and it's suddenly converted to steam, you can have an explosion. And it's rather dramatic because it causes a blast wave, but it also throws molten metal in the direction of the operator, which is not uh, not a fun thing to have happen. All right, so that's uh, that's some background of um, explosions and sort of the physics and the mechanics. Uh, what I'd like to talk about now are uh, some of the blast effects. We'll, we'll talk about air blast fragmentation, cratering, ground shock, thermal effects, but we'll focus later on air blast predictions since that primarily uh, is what of is is what is most most interested, I think, uh, by you guys today. In most cases, in industrial settings or where government anti-terrorism requirements apply, if you're doing a, a you know a, a design for a, a courthouse or some other government facility where you you have to do a little blast design, typically you're going to look at air blast only. You're not going to look at some of the other effects. Um, in special purpose government facilities for law enforcement and justice facilities you may have to actually look at uh, some impact requirements, but those are typically associated with ballistic protection. Um, you may have a special application where someone says, I would like you to consider the debris from a car bomb uh, so that not only is our structural system and our, our fenestration or our facade designed uh, to resist the blast wave, we want to make sure that if uh, uh, a piece of the wheel off the car flies up that uh, we we are sufficiently robust uh, to protect uh, the occupants inside from that. Again, those are special. Typically, you don't see that in specifications for blast design, but those are special applications. In industrial settings, kind of a different story. Um, for ruptured, uh, ruptured pressure vessels, um, steam explosions, as I mentioned, for the steam explosion, you're going to worry about the, the molten metal uh, as well as uh, the air blast associated with the steam. Um, Electrical transformers uh, is an I interesting uh, project. A lot of those, in fact, most of those are are oil insulated and oil cooled. Um, there's headspace in those oil tanks. Uh, if you have a short, um, you can actually, uh, to use a petrochemical term, crack the uh, oil that's that's in that tank and uh, produce uh, some compounds like propane in the headspace of that transformer. So you may actually uh, rupture the conductor and the insulator above and throw pieces of porcelain hundreds of feet. Uh, so that may be of concern in designing, um, you know, pedestrian areas, occupied spaces inside the building or other critical equipment uh, at that plant. Well, let's talk about uh, a blast wave. So we, we've talked about the basics of explosions, uh, different sources. Let's talk about regardless of how uh, that energy is uh, released, uh, the blast wave and air that occurs. And there's a video here that shows um, many of the aspects of, of the blast wave that we're going to get into and talk about here um, shortly. So this was a a test. I don't, I'm not sure why, but all these explosions, it's all right to left. So you'll see the fireball there on the left. 
you'll see the shock wave if you I'll play this again but uh, if you carefully observe it you can see it again moving from right to left the other thing that um, when I play it again I'd like you to to take note of uh, is uh, the spherical nature of the advancing shock not necessarily in the vertical direction but the spherical nature um, horizontally in that you will actually see the center window so this is a concrete uh, reaction wall that this was a test of some glazing or some windows in the middle and you'll actually see the windows break from the center out this is obviously a high-speed video the other thing you'll see at the very end is you'll actually see uh, because the atmospheric conditions there's a good bit of moisture in the air uh, on this particular day you'll you'll see some moisture moving back towards the explosion and that's the recovery of the atmosphere we talked about in kind of that, that negative phase. So you'll see windows break from center out here in a second. And then at the edges, you'll see a combination of what we'll talk about later is clearing and also negative phase occurring. So kind of a neat uh, illustration of the different aspects. Um, so we'll talk more about predicting air blast in a minute. Uh, fragmentation is, is another um, piece of, of the uh, 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 pie that you have to be uh, you have to be concerned with uh, for certain types of explosions. Um, what I'm going to show you is a video that uh, our friends at the State Department allowed us to uh, show. Uh, and what you're going to see in the middle here is a, a reaction structure that has a, a wall inside of it. And way off to the left, uh, there is an explosion. And it's an explosion that's adjacent to a perimeter wall. So you could think of it as a, a compound uh, fence barrier. This particular perimeter wall has a, has a concrete foundation, a concrete uh, knee wall, and then has a steel um, fence above it. And so uh, this is kind of a good illustration of the timing of uh, debris and uh, what your structure may be subjected to. So you see the blast wave come by, you see a few pieces of fence start to come by, you see the knee wall debris start to come by, larger pieces of the knee wall and the foundation start to come by, part of the crater, which is the dark uh, plume that's kind of heading your or heading in the structure's direction. And finally, some remnants that go rolling by um, of the fence. And I, I show this to point out that there there may be situations where uh, if you deliberately introduce something, and that this is called secondary and tertiary debris, uh, primary debris or primary casing fragments from an explosion are, are typically used, that, that term is typically used to describe uh, like the case around uh, an explo uh, explosive material like that you would have um, in a military explosive where it's specifically designed to fragment uh, so that fragment those fragments can uh, provide injury. Those are primary fragments. Secondary fragments are really things like um, the concrete debris we're seeing here, the pieces of the fence um, that uh, are also going to hit your structure. And there may be cases like this where you, you know, deliberately introduce that knee wall and fence right next to the explosive. And so obviously you've got to design this structure for the air blast because that knee wall and fence isn't going to do much to stop that. But you want to design your structure to also resist the impact associated uh, with this later on. There are methods to do that. Um, it can be both a penetration event and a load event, so you have to consider both when you're when you're designing your structure. Um, an explosive that is close to or on the ground uh, when it's detonated is going to cause a crater. In other words, it's it's going to dislodge the material. The high pressures associated with the near field of the explosion uh, above that ground surface are going to cause air blasts. Below that ground surface are going to heave the material. Craters can happen uh, in soil. They can happen uh, in uh, concrete, um, they can happen in water, where you get water plumes um, associated with um, explosions. Um, the size depends on the soil properties. Um, this happens to be a picture for 220 pounds of uh, TNT explosive. Uh, 
Uh, the crater depth, as measured, uh, can range from about four feet to eight feet, and the uh, uh, diameter about three times that. And there are methods in uh, one of the references that we'll, we'll highlight at the end of the presentation, um, UFC 33401, for example. Uh, there are methods to predict that crater. And, uh, you know, one, again, mostly you're going to be concerned with air blast when you're designing a, a, a typical steel building. But if, you're, uh, if you have a, a scenario where you have an explosive that's very close to your structure, maybe it's a smaller explosive, uh, you could actually be cratering um, a portion uh, next to um, a column or a pier or part of your foundation that you may want to consider for later overall response to your structure from progressive collapse. It may not be that you have to just worry about the air blast. Uh, you may have to worry about um, actually um, compromising the foundation um, of that particular element, even if it's not uh, failed itself. Ground shock is associated uh, with cratering. What ground shock is is essentially um, a shock wave uh, in soil that uh, rapidly decays to uh, essentially an elastic wave that travels through soil. And there, again, there are ways to predict that. Um, this is a plot of, of radial particle velocity away from an explosion as a function of range from, again, 220 pounds uh, at TNT that's placed fi uh, half a foot uh, below ground. The reason this is expressed in particle velocity is that when you calculate um, soil stress or pressures on a buried structure, um, the, one of the simple ways to do it is to take the free field uh, particle velocity uh, and double it because your pressure on your structure will be pretty much like uh, waves in elastic medium where that ground shock when it encounters your structure uh, in the midfield or the far field uh, will look like an elastic event and you double that free field pressure to determine the stress on your structure. Again, um, this may or may not be of interest. Um, it takes a very large explosion to produce uh, ground shock that would be significantly damaging to a typical commercial structure if your explosive charge is a sufficient distance away. If it's that big that it's going to compromise your structure with ground shock, it's probably already compromised your structure with air blast. So it may not be uh, uh, of, of as much worry as it would seem to be. Thermal effects um, could be important. Um, but typically, uh, from the uh, types of events that um, uh, you will um, encounter, that the fireball and the, the release of heat is too fast uh, for materials to actually absorb that heat and combust uh, spontaneously. There certainly can be fires associated with explosions if uh, you break a gas line um, or you introduce a fuel. Um, you know, the World Trade Center um, uh, tragedy, um, you know, the terrorists brought their own uh, fuel with them in the airplanes. So that contributed significantly to the fire, and the fire, of course, contributed significantly to the collapse. But generally speaking, the detonation of a high explosive, um, the transit, transient nature of the light and heat is such that it's not going to cause uh, spontaneous combustion of combustible materials, uh, even in the near field. All right, uh, blast load and structure interaction. That's an important uh, set of concepts, concepts to grasp. Uh, we'll first talk about uh, TNT equivalency. Um, and the reason that we're going to talk about that is uh, there are a lot of different types of explosives out there. And most often, when we predict blast loads, we're going to use uh, TNT equivalent methods, uh, whether they be empirically derived, those engineering methods I, I mentioned, um, or even computational methods, you're probably going to convert uh, the actual explosive or fuel you have to a, to a TNT equivalent. Um, it says here TNT is not the optimal material to use for a baseline, but really no explosive is, and that's because um, uh, TNT uh, and other explosives um, are oxygen deficient, uh, 
Um, they require oxygen in the atmosphere to completely combust. Um, and the bottom line of this is is that the equivalent weights, and we'll talk about what that means for pressure and impulse uh, for TNT, can differ depending on your atmospheric conditions and also depending on your standoff from your explosion, uh, depending on the amount of oxygen, for example, the explosive has had the ability to react with. So your equivalency may vary. But generally speaking, this is an accepted method um, to convert uh, explosives to equivalent amounts of TNT. And the reason for that is is that some explosives are more energetic than TNT, um, where we have established our baseline methods for prediction. Um, so, for example, uh, composition C4, it takes less composition C4 to produce the same blast environment um, than it does TNT. So 73 pounds of C4 would be equivalent to 100 pounds of TNT. Likewise, there are explosives like uh, ANFO, ammonium nitrate and fuel oil, uh, an explosive that's been used for um, uh, mining operations and quarrying operations for decades and decades, unfortunately also used in terrorist attacks. Um, it takes more of that material to generate the same um, energy release. And so there are ways uh, to calculate that equivalency. The most common is to use what are called equivalency factors. And typically there is an equivalency factor for pressure and there's an equ equivalency factor for impulse, impulse being basically the time integral of, of pressure or the integral of pressure time history. Um, or the area under the pressure time history curve. And so these factors, um, uh, to determine what your TNT weight would be, for example, if you have a given amount of C4, you would use a factor of 1.3 to convert that to a TNT weight to determine pressure in the, in the methods that we're going to go over in a few minutes you would use a different factor to determine impulse. Likewise, for the ammonium nitrate, um, you would uh, actually reduce the amount that you had uh, to do your, your TNT-based pressure and impulse equivalency calculations. So those are tabular values that are available uh, in the literature for a variety of explosives. When you don't have um, tabular values, um, you can look up some of the chemical properties for the material that is of interest and do a simple calculation uh, by using the heat of detonation um, of the particular explosive of interest and just do a ratio of the heat of detonation of that explosive over the heat of detonation of TNT. That then becomes your equivalency factor that you will use to multiply by the weight of explosive you have to determine that equivalent TNT weight. So that's a fairly simple algebraic conversion of different types of explosives uh, to an equivalent weight of TNT. So next we'll talk a little bit about ideal blast waves. And ideal simply means this would be a blast wave in air that uh, would emanate from a high explosive detonation prior to or in the absence of any obstructions that would be provided by uh, a building, um, by um, walls or, or um, utility poles or any obstructions, cars, vehicles, anything else. Um, and the factors that um, are of most interest and the parameters are of most interest in an ideal blast wave, which is represented here um, in, uh, by the red line, is an instantaneous uh, rise to a peak pressure. In this case, this is uh, what's called a side-on or an incident or a free field blast wave. Again, this is an ideal wave prior to uh, encountering any obstruction. So you go from ambient pressure, uh, and this is a pressure versus time representation. So you go from ambient pressure up to a peak side-on pressure. As that shock wave then passes the point of interest, imagine yourself laying flat on the ground on a shock wave uh, blowing by you. What you're going to sense is that instantaneous rise to pressure and then a decay back down to ambient. And then in an ideal case in the free field, there'll actually be a negative pressure phase, uh, again, associated with 
uh, many factors, but basically the, recover, the recovery of the air to the passage of the shock front. Um, this sort of kind of looks like uh, an exponential decay. It's actually typically represented as what's called a, a Freelander decay. There's a particular equation uh, for this decay that's uh, included in many of the blast prediction uh, methods that are out there. Um, the duration uh, of the time, essentially, from this instantaneous pressure rise uh, to a decay back to ambient is called the positive phase. The duration of uh, the negative pressure event is called the negative uh, phase. Um, uh, the arrival time is the point at which from the real time of the detonation of the explosive to the time that it arrives at your point of interest is called the arrival time. As I mentioned a minute ago, the, the time integral of pressure is called uh, impulse or specific impulse, specific simply meaning that it is a force per unit area as, a, as opposed to a total force. So you have positive uh, specific impulse and negative specific impulse. So those are kind of the key parameters um, associated with um, an ideal pressure wave. Again, incident pressure is that th that has not encountered some sort of obstruction, um, and the specific impulse is the area under that pressure time curve. Uh, the time of arrival is uh, T sub A. So let's talk a little bit more about air bursts and surface bursts. And these are different in one fundamental way, and that's that uh, f a free air burst assumes that uh, you have a detonation in air where there is absolutely no obstruction, including no ground surface to consider. So this might be an event where um, you have an artillery weapon that is designed to detonate uh, above a structure or above personnel or above a piece of military equipment such that um, the air blast is emanating from the free air and, and propagating down towards the target of interest. For most uh, counterterrorism applications, this is not um, really um, something that you would consider. Most often, you're going to consider um, either air bursts or surface bursts, and that's where the ground comes into play. And it essentially enhances uh, the shock wave that occurs because you do have that ground surface that provides one uh, initial major reflection that reinforces the shock wave that comes from the explosive itself. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, the term that's often used, uh, most often used to describe that interaction with the ground is called the formation of a mock stem. And what that means is that there is a combination of a reflected wave from the ground surface that recombines with the initial shock wave from the explosion to form a, um, a vertical shock front uh, that your subject that your structure then uh, could be subjected subjected to. So that can be called the mock stem or the mock front, and again, it's that combination uh, and it's uh, this vertical portion. Uh, of this wave. And so what you're seeing here is this little asterisk uh, is the, the point of the detonation. And so at that point, uh, you're going to have shock waves that are emanating out from that explosion. I'll try to move the arrow slowly so it doesn't uh, particulate on you. But you'll have those shock waves, which are represented um, uh, by the, the solid lines that are coming out. But you're also going to have shock waves that reflect off of the ground surface that emanate. Those are the dashed lines uh, that are coming up here. Where those um, dashed lines and solid lines meet is called the triple point. And the height of that triple point um, uh, determines whether your structure will be subjected to that vertical front um, that accounts for the interaction of the ground or not. In most cases, um, you're going to be designing structures where there's sufficient standoff and a limited height. So let's say a vehicle-borne explosion might just be a few feet off of the ground. Um, that uh, the, the triple point is going to be sufficiently high such that it is above your structure a fairly short distance away from the point. 
of initiation so that you're not going to have to worry about whether or not your structure uh, uh, roof is below that triple point. Um, so this just shows uh, pressure variation. Uh, if the point of interest is above the triple point, you're actually going to see first it's kind of a side on pressure that jumps up to a reflected pressure. Conversely, um, uh, if you are uh, below the triple point, you'll see this uh, more ideal um, form of the blast wave. So surface burst to the case where uh, we're going to just assume that uh, we are um, our point of interest is is below that uh, height of the triple point. So we get that that mock stem that interacts with our structure, and we have what's called a hemispherical surface burst. And in that case, um, our structure, uh, or represented as a shelter here, sees that um, vertical uh, wave front that interacts with the structure um, and uh, the parameters of side on pressure, which reflect up to reflected pressure, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so we don't have to worry about that spatial distribution vertically. Now, there is some spatial distribution horizontally that you may want to consider, and we'll talk about that, and we'll talk about clearing in a few minutes. Again, for a hemispherical surface burst, we're talking about an explosive charge at or near the ground. Um, structural elements are perpendicular or parallel to the direction of the shock wave. In other words, that mock front uh, is going to be parallel with your structure front. Um, the, the blast curves, the empirically derived curves that have been included in some of these prediction codes uh, account for that ground reflection. TNT is almost always the reference explosive, and um, these, these uh, predictions are typically used for design of blast-resistant buildings, as I said, because of um, the case uh, of the explosive typically not being very far off the ground and your standoff being uh, relatively sufficient. So uh, there's a set of curves that are available in the open literature. Um, this is UFC 33402, um, Structures to Resist the Effects of Accidental Explosions, um, that's available. Um, you can basically determine using a, a factor called scale distance, we'll talk about that in a minute, um, to directly determine reflected pressure or incident pressure or many of the other parameters associated with the shock wave. So if you know your charge weight, which is W, you know your standoff, which is R, you can calculate this scaled standoff Z, and you can read off these, this curve, and we'll do some examples in a few minutes uh, that show how you can use these curves to determine blast pressure and, and impulse. Likewise, there's negative uh, pressure curves. Uh, again, this is for um, uh, surface burst charges, or sometimes those are called hemispherical TNT surface burst um, charge on the, and that should say ground over here, it's, it was cut off. Uh, but again, the parameters associated with a negative phase can be determined, again, using this same scaled standoff. All right, let's talk about reflected versus side-on loads. We talked in a, a few minutes ago about ground shock loads and how um, you can take that free field uh, soil stress and use elastic uh, wave uh, combination theory and just double that stress to determine the load on your structure. It's a little bit different in air. Um, those shocks can be significantly higher, but it's the same concept. It's a concept where you have an expanding shock wave that encounters a structure, and at that interface, that side-on uh, shock reflects up to what's called a reflected shock. So at the point where the shock wave impacts that structure, the incident particle velocity becomes zero, and the pressure density and temperature increased to the values greater than those for the incident. And the enhanced reflected pressure um, is only twice the incident pressure, and that's the elastic wave theory, for very weak incident pressure events, uh, typically less than 15 psi, one atmosphere. But can that reflection factor or that increase in pressure over the uh, incident pressure wave can be as high as a factor of 12 for very strong shocks. So very different from uh, the elastic wave um, 
theory that uh, we all learned in, in fluid mechanics. So uh, this is a representation of that reflection factor for pressure as a function of the peak incident pressure. So you can see as you're at very low um, peak incident pressures, that reflectant reflection factor over the side on pressure is in fact two. But as you increase that to say um, 1,000 PSI, uh, that reflection factor can be as much as nine times um, that incident pressure. So the pressure that your structure is subjected to can be as much as uh, you know, 12 to 13 times uh, that incident pressure. So uh, we talked about uh, determining pressure uh, as a function, uh, reflected pressure as a function of incident pressure, uh, um, but you can also determine uh, reflected pressure versus angle of incidence. And here's where your structure wall may be um, vertical and parallel to that mock front but your structure may be turned slightly with respect to uh, the uh, path from the detonation point to your structure. There may be an angle of incidence there. So that's shown here as an angle alpha. And if your structure is oriented anything other than vertically, you're going to have a reduction uh, in reflected pressure as a function of that angle of incidence. So as you can imagine, it's going to decay. And these are reflected pressures as a function of incident pressure. These are values of peak incident pressure um, here as you go up on this chart where my green arrow is. And as you increase in angle of incidence, that pressure is going to drop. Now, at some point, somewhere between 45 and 60 degrees, you have an increase, and that's because you actually have a mock stem effect in the other direction. But generally speaking, this reflected pressure is going to decay as a function of the angle of incidence, and that can be pr predicted uh, using these curves. Likewise, uh, reflected impulse uh, can be determined as a function of the angle of incidence. Here again are reflection factors for um, impulse as a function of the strength of the shock, in other words, the incident pressure, but also as a function of the angle of incidence. So as you would expect, that impulse decreases as your angle of incidence increases. Just as to give you an idea of incident pressure versus range, um, it decays rapidly. So pressure, reflected pressure decays uh, with um, an exponent that's uh, about 2.8, so decays very rapidly as you move away from the detonation point. Um, impulse uh, uh, reduces, is reduced uh, with an exponent, uh, exponent of uh, exponentially with an exponent about 1.25. The reason this is important to see visually is that every foot of standoff that you have available to relocate your structure is important and can significantly reduce the pressure. So location of a, of a structure on a site where you know where a potential detonation could occur is vitally important in, in, to, in the efficiency of the design of the structure. All right, finally, we're going to talk a little bit about predicting blast loads on structures. Um, again, as I mentioned, there are several methods to do that. Uh, we'll talk about empirical and engineering methods and computational methods. But a concept first that is often used in blast-resistant design is something called the equivalent triangular load. And what this simply means is that when you use those charts that we looked at a few minutes ago where we can determine uh, reflected pressure, incident pressure, and impulse as a function of that scaled standoff or that Z, uh, which is the standoff divided by the cube root of the charge weight, um, Using those two parameters, you can construct a simple blast wave that's called an equivalent triangular load. Um, it's a typical assumption used in design where you're simply taking the impulse, which is the area under um, the pressure time history, multiplying it by two, because this is a triangle, and dividing by the peak pressure, and that gives you your duration. So you can construct a load curve or load history that is your peak pressure, your reflected pressure, uh, 
a duration at, that has uh, that's determined using the impulse with the assumption of this equivalent triangle. Typically, you uh, ignore a negative phase, although you can construct an equivalent triangular form for the negative phase as well. Um, generally, this is an acceptable approach. Sometimes you have to be concerned with this if the period of natural uh, uh, response of your structure is about the same as the duration, which doesn't happen very often, but could. Uh, you may want to be more concerned about the shape of this wave because uh, the dynamics could impact the, the, your predicted response if you oversimplify that, uh, that wave. Typically for loads on structures, we're going to assume that the face that is presented to the explosion uh, is going to be subjected to reflected pressure. The orthogonal faces, uh, the sides and the roof, are going to be subjected to incident pressure. Uh, and the back, and we'll see in a minute how this works, is also going to be subjected to an incident pressure, but at a slightly larger standoff. So again, these are some simplifications often used in blast design. So for the front wall or the wall facing a charge, um, you're going to determine a standoff to the point of interest, and you're also going to determine if you have an angle of, an inc angle of incidence, you'll use those two parameters with your charge weight, uh, to determine your reflected pressure as a function of the angle of incidence and your reflected impulse as a function of the, of the angle of incidence. For the sidewall, you're going to do uh, something a little bit different in that you're going to also determine a standoff. So you're going to determine the shortest distance to the edge of your structure from your point of detonation. But you're also going to add a distance back to the point of interest on the sidewall, and then you'll use that total distance as your standoff in those prediction charts um, with uh, this side-on pressure curves. Because again, for the orthogonal faces, uh, the roof and the sides, we're going to use side-on pressure. So the only difference is you're going to use the charge weight that you have with this combined standoff of the distance to uh, the closest edge plus um, a distance back to the side of the structure. Very similar on the roof, you'll determine the distance uh, to the roof edge, closest distance to the roof edge, and you'll add that additional uh, distance back uh, to the portion of the roof that is the point of interest. So uh, as you can imagine on the sides uh, and on the roof, if you've got a deep structure, these loads could vary significantly and that may be important in the layout of uh, your structural system on the roof. The back wall, um, a simplification that's often used, there's a lot that goes on in the back wall of a structure. There's uh, lots of uh, uh, things that are caused by vortices and, and other things, but a simplification that's conservative is to now add a third distance. So you've got the distance to the roof edge, <clears throat> or it could be the side if it's if it uh, the roof is uh, fairly tall, if it's a tall building. And you add the distance across the top or the side of the structure, and then you add the distance to the point of interest uh, on the back wall. That becomes your standoff. And again, uh, you use the side-on pressure curves to determine your loads for that scenario. So as I mentioned, um, you're going to consider uh, the standoffs that are available, but you also want to consider the site. As I mentioned, every little bit of standoff helps, uh, and uh, relocating the building uh, may be significant uh, for design efficiency. You also have to imagine what's not there at the time. There may be a way for a load to be introduced on a side that you're not thinking about or not seeing visually on the plans at the time of design. So typically there's a there's an assessment that's done uh, called a threat assessment to determine uh, where the existing loads but also potential future loads might be. Another thing to consider is that um, blast loads are not uniform. Again, as you can imagine, uh, if you have a large building in terms of both width and height, um, that's not going to be a uniform load over the entire surface. So there are ways to calculate what's called an equivalent uniform load. And this is a dramatic example. This happens to be 50 pounds of TNT. 
and it's shown uh, the impulse um, that's applied to a surface is shown at two different standoffs, at a 10-foot standoff and a 30-foot standoff. And this is um, uh, the building height uh, versus the impulse. And you can see that there's a much more dramatic distribution of impulse um, at a close standoff uh, than there is at the larger standoff. So that's something important to consider because you can conservatively design for the entire uh, peak impulse, or you can average that load to get something less and be a little more efficient. Again, uh, that's typically done in single degree of freedom applications. Uh, there are ways in SDOF applications to factor the load as a function of your load shape, but typically you determine an average load ahead of time, and that's applied then as a uniform load um, uh, in your uh, representation. Uh, clearing is another parameter that uh, can come into play, and that's, again, for very large loaded surfaces. Um, you will have a, a, a transient reflection that occurs or a rarefaction waves that occurs at the edge of the structure, um, you know, where the, the side interfaces with the front, roof interfaces with the front. That wave propagates back towards the center of the, tr uh, the structure and actually reduces the overall pressure and impulse that's applied. We've seen this video before. Um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll play it one more time. But this is a case where you actually have clearing effects um, that come back into play. Again, it's that, that sudden uh, relief that you can see on the edges there that's partially caused by the rarefaction wave. Um, the important thing to remember there is that there are um, empirically based methods and computational methods to account for that clearing. So it'll ask you what the closest distance to your uh, building edge is, and that will determine a reduced pressure or impulse associated with your load. All right, so finally we're going to talk about some blast prediction tools, um, and we'll work a couple example problems. Uh, the most prominent empirically based uh, curves that are out there developed in uh, 1984 by some gentlemen at uh, Aberdeen, Aberdeen Proving Ground are they called the Kingery Bull Mash curves. Those are the spaghetti curves we affectionately referred to earlier. Those curves have been introduced into uh, a variety of software programs. They're polynomial fits, so it's easy to use them in different programs or in special applications even. ConWeb is probably one of the more familiar programs. BlastFX Computer is one that uh, DDSB, uh, Defense Safety Board. Um, they're also used in ray tracing in BlastX. Um, but computational fluid dynamics uh, actually considers the actual physics um, there are a few codes that are out there. Air3D is one produced in Europe, Shamrock by Applied Research Associates, uh, FeeFlow uh, by a company called SAIC, uh, now called Lidos, or the division of SAIC became Lidos. These are reaction kinetic codes that will actually um, consider a shock combination uh, explicitly. Blastex does that somewhat uh, based on tab tabular methods. And again, ConWeb is the simple approach that takes the Kingery Bullmash curves and applies them. Uh, BLAST environments can be complex, so it may take using an engineering code like BLASTX or uh, like uh, some of the CFD codes to calculate um, the actual loads that are impinging on your structures. This is an uh, uh, a top view of an urban setting. So you could think of it as, as of buildings located in streets in an urban setting, and you'll see a shock wave propagate around the corner on the left, kind of an isometric view around the corner and down the street on the other side as it interacts with the buildings. So the volume that you're seeing here, uh, it would be sort of the street uh, scape. Um, and likewise, on the right, you're you're seeing a shock propagate uh, uh, from the center here and down the, the adjacent streets and down the street. So it can be a very complicated environment to consider, and so that would be the reason for using more complicated tools. 
Um, there are some more readily available tools called CONWEP, uh, Conventional Weapons Effects, and BLASTX. Those are controlled, but uh, if you have a uh, government project that you're working on, you can request those from the Protective Design Center uh, in Omaha, Nebraska, that uh, controls the access to those codes. You go to their website, fill out some forms, you'll be, uh, be approved, and you can download the software, and you'll get a key to use it on uh, specific platforms. But CONWEP does a lot of things. It predicts air blast. Uh, it also does a lot of other uh, weapons effects calculations that we talked about earlier that have to do with fragmentation and penetration. We'll talk a little bit and show a couple of screen captures uh, from CONWEP in a minute. BLASTX uh, does some more complicated scenarios, internal environments where you've got multiple reflection, uh, reflecting surfaces, uh, you may have multiple rooms that BLAST is propagating through. It also does temperature histories. Um, it essentially does the initial shock calculation using Kingery bull mash, but then combines those shocks based on um, tabulated um, hydrocode simulations that uh, had done, been done ahead of time. So it has shock combination rules uh, that it uses to combine those shocks. Uh, blast is assumed to originate from spherical or cylindrical explosions. Uh, Blastex is a little tricky to use in defining the geometry, but it does a reasonable job in combining shocks. So let's do a quick example of um, calculating a hemispherical blast load of a 50-pound charge at a 30-foot standoff, and we'll compare the spaghetti curves, the Kingery bull mash curves, with the software tool Conweb, which really is the same set of calculation uh, procedures just put in a computer program. So first thing we want to do is take our standoff and divide it by the cube root of our charge weight, which is 50 pounds, to determine our z, or our scaled distance. That's 8.14. If I go to my chart and I go over here, let me get my arrow, I go over here to 8.14 and I work my way up to the chart and I find the piece of spaghetti that's associated with um, side on uh, pressure, which is sort of the magenta, depending on how your screen represents it, dashed curve. And I go over here, I'm going to directly read, because again, pressures, you can directly read off this chart, a side on pressure of 14 psi. If I want to determine impulse, there's an additional step involved, but I, I basically go to the same z. I go to the incident impulse curve, which is uh, this blue dashed curve, I go over to the side and I read a value off of 9.5. I multiply that by the cube root of the charge weight, uh, which is uh, 3.68, to get an impulse of 35 psi milliseconds. So I can directly read these values. Uh, again, those are the two primary values you could use to construct that equivalent uh, pressure uh, uh, triangular pressure time history curve. Conweb let you do it just by plugging in some numbers. So you'll pick hemispherical surface burst. You'll say I've got a weapon or a charge size and a range, and then I'll input uh, the standoff and I'll input the charge weight. And Conwip will spit out that for 50 pounds at 30 feet, I've got a peak incident pressure of 14.38 psi, a normally reflected pressure of 39.52. Um, uh, and a uh, incident impulse of 35.68. So the uh, values from Conweb compare, if you remember very well, to the values that we just got off the uh, spaghetti curves. Obviously, Conweb gives you a lot more information. Um, in, and uh, another thing Conweb does is allow you to extract a, a Freelander decay pressure time curve that you could use if you don't want to use that uh, equivalent triangle. So comparison of results, we got 14 psi and 35 psi milliseconds out of the uh, spaghetti curves or the Kingery bull mash curves. We got about the same thing out of Conweb, and we, we hopefully should, since they're based on the same thing. Uh, Conweb example on a building, again, um, a couple of points of detonation and several points of interest, and we'll kind of pop through these one by one. Let's say with charge A, determine the pressure and impulse at W1, that's on the front wall. 
with a charge at A, let's determine it on the roof, and the charge at A prime, which is off to the side, let's determine it at location W2. What you're going to do in Conweb for the front wall is you're going to say, well, I've got um, 400 pounds of TNT, which is the charge weight I've selected at 50 feet. I'm going to read off my reflected pressure, 64.44 PSI, up here at the top, and I'm going to read off my reflected impulse of 209 PSI milliseconds. So Conweb's going to determine that. So you're just going to use standoff to the building uh, with the charge weight. With the charge at A, determine the roof pressure at R1 on the roof. Well, as the little isometric previously showed, we're going to take the distance to the building, but we're going to add the distance on the roof. We're also going to consider the slant distance. So we're going to take 51.9 feet was the slant distance to the roof, plus 25 feet. That gives us a range to target of 77 feet for that 400 pounds. So now I'm going to get... Again, you're going to use incident pressure and impulse uh, to uh, determine your roof load. So increase standoff associated with the distance back on the roof, and you're going to use incident pressure. So at A prime now, um, we've moved the charge over, which is kind of tricky, but we're just going to calculate this distance to W2, and we're going to use incident impulse at this 75-foot standoff uh, to determine the sidewall loads. You could determine a different pressure and impulse as you move back uh, the wall if you would like to refine those pressures and impulse. All right, so that's a quick example using Conweb uh, to determine some actual building loads. Um, as I mentioned throughout the presentation today, there are a number of good references. Um, um, in addition to hopefully you'll consider this <laughs> this presentation as a good reference as as a primer uh, for you on blast loads, but there are also some uh, more detailed references out there. Uh, AISC has a couple of uh, very good ones. Design Guide 26. Uh, uh, Ramon Gilsons and his uh, compadres uh, developed that. Um, that has a good description of many of the concepts that I presented today. It also gets into predicting response, which Aldo will get into in the next presentation, uh, part two. There's also a document uh, that was produced a few years back, but still has good information in it called Facts for Steel Buildings. It also has uh, some information about progressive collapse in there. Uh, those are available for download at the AISC website. Um, there are a couple of, of Department of Defense documents. Um, that are good ones to get. The one that is uh, uh, unrestricted, that's available for download, is called uh, UFC, and that stands for Unified Facilities Criteria, uh, 33402, Structures to Resist the Effects of Accidental Explosions. Um, that has a very good summary. It has the uh, charts to calculate pressure and impulse in there, so it's a good starting point. Uh, for blast resistant design. There's another DOD document. Um, it's just off by one digit, <laughs> 33401. This, however, is a restricted document because it has more information about weapons. Um, but it's also a very good document to get if you have a government project and you can get your customer to uh, allow you justification to acquire that restricted document. Both those are, are very good. Bill Baker's book, Explosion Hazards and Evaluation, uh, written in 1983, uh, is a wonderful reference for not only high explosions, but all the other uh, energetic sources that um, we discussed today. And with that, um, that is your um, blast load uh, and explosions uh, overview. And um, I think uh, Christina... Um, may queue up some questions for us if we um, have any, or I can read back um, on the yes. uh, overall chat. We do, have some, we do have some questions for you. Um, okay. Just as a reminder, if you have not entered your questions into the chat yet, you can still do that, and we will try to uh, get your question. The first question that we have is regarding slide 14. And the question is regarding the supersonic velocity. Does that refer to the velocity of within the explosive or in the air? 
No, this this chart is depicting it within the explosive. So you you actually have the detonation front travels at a velocity that's higher than the sound speed in the the unreacted explosive material. So that's that's what that's referring to here. Great, thank you. The next question is, why is the reflected wave not added to the load for sidewalls? For sidewalls, um, the the simplified assumption is that um, that sidewall is exactly orthogonal. In other words, um, it does not prevent an obstruction to the blast wave. So. Uh, what you could think of it as as that shock wave um, approaches the structure, that shock wave, of course, is much larger than your building. And so the portion of the shock wave that encounters your structure will reflect up to that factor between 2 and 14, like uh, we talked about on the slide. But But the shock wave that's actually outside the presented area of your structure is just going to pass by. And so what the side of the structure will see is simply the incident pressure because it does not provide an obstruction there. And so you're not going to actually have any reflected pressure there. You're going to just have the incident pressure that gets applied to uh, the side of the structure. Okay, thank you. The next question is referring to slide 64. I'll navigate us over there. Could you explain again why between the angles of about 45 and 60 there's an increase in the pressure? Yeah, this <laughs> this is a source of some confusion over the years, and actually many of the tools that people will, uh, computational tools, they'll ignore um, this uh, hump that's in, in the middle of this, but but it's essentially it's essentially similar to uh, the mock front um, uh, or the the triple point formulation that we described uh, for the ground surface, and this is because you actually have the structure acting as another surface for reflection, which again creates sort of another triple point, and so you actually have an enhancement at a certain angle associated with, for the, uh, with that. Like I say, many computational methods for simplification purposes um, will will fit some lines down through there that kind of removes uh, that hump for the impulse. Uh, I'm sorry for the pressure, because if you if you remember those impulse curves, they don't have that <laughs> that hump in them. And so what's going to happen is is if you're determining an equivalent um, load history for a point on the structure. Um, if you've got a pressure that's higher at that point, but then you go to the reflected uh, impulse curve associated with that angle of incidence, it's actually not going to be elevated, so you're going to kind of get a weird discontinuity there. So in many cases, this is ignored. But in fact, this is what's presented in the literature. Okay, great. Thank you. The next question is, when do you consider the effects of negative pressure? <laughs> when your project specifications tell you to, and that, that's kind of a mischievous answer. Um, but negative pressure is something that is real, um, and it is most often considered when the structural element that um, you are designing could be, uh, the response of that structural element could be adversely affected by that negative pressure. So you could you could think of it as, as something that is a function of, you know, what you're designing, not just the load. And I'll give you a great example. So windows are a good example, and that's that you can actually design a piece of um, glazing, whether it, it be monolithic glass or laminated glass, that can take the positive phase uh, pressure and impulse. In other words, it doesn't fail under those loads. But because of the short span of the window, the period of response of that window may be sufficiently short that the window would be, you know, the elastic energy that's still available in the window will cause it to rebound back towards the charge. So you're, you're pushing that window in, you're storing up some portion of elastic energy. Aldo can talk about this a little bit in part two, but, but as that element re rebounds, that could possibly be in phase with that negative pressure. Now you have a velocity of that structural element moving back towards the charge and that velocity is enhanced 
because of that negative pressure. So that's kind of a worst case situation. So windows would be one case where uh, you definitely would want to consider negative phase. Um, some lighter, um, shorter span structural elements, you may also want to do that because you could actually have a larger predicted response back towards the explosion than you might on the initial inbound. We call that inbound and rebound. And so that would be a, uh, those would be some cases where you want to consider that. Okay, great. Thank you. Next question. Is the reflected wave from the ground or is it from the front wall of the building? Yeah, so um, there's, a, there's a couple different reflected waves. When we were going through the explanation of the formation of the, the mock front or the, the, the triple uh, point, we talked about the effect of ground surface reflection. And if the charge is sufficiently high off the ground, and Christina's brought the slide back up, um, you pot potentially could have a case where your structure called shelter here, if you moved that over to the left, a portion of that shelter could be above the point where you have this vertical mock front uh, or reinforced wave, as it's called, from the ground surface. In most cases, you're going to be looking at hemispherical surface bursts where you don't have to worry about that. And the prediction curves actually account for that. So the pressure and the impulse that you're getting out of the prediction curves of the software, and if you may have noticed in the Conwip software, there was a button there that you could push for hemispherical surface burst or free air burst. That's because the Kingery bull mash curves, there's sets for both, for hemispherical and, and free air burst. The reflective pressure associated with a building is truly, so when this mock front uh, in, in encounters the building, it is a, a reflection of that mock front or that vertical incident pressure that reflects up to a reflected pressure on the building. So, so there's both a ground reflection. Most of the time that's taken care of in the predictive techniques by um, assuming that it's a hemispherical surface burst. So you don't have to worry about that ground reflection because it's captured in the predictive techniques. Whereas the, the uh, structure itself um, is important in terms of its angle of incidence um, and its width in terms of determining clearing. But that's where your what we typically call an incident wave is going to reflect up to a reflected pressure wave because that structure provides that obstruction. Okay, thank you. And we have time for one more question. I'm going to take us to slide 90. Would you mind re-explaining how to use this graph? Sure. Um, so the, the parameters that you're going to generally be provided, somebody's going to say, uh, my threat charge weight is, um, for example, in this case, um, 50 pounds. And the distance between that threat charge weight and my building is 30 feet. So I've got an R, or a standoff, of 30 feet, and I've got a W or a charge weight of 50 pounds. Well, this chart is a plot of scale distance, which is standoff R divided by the cube root of the charge weight, or Z is what that's uh, called. And then you've got a whole bunch of plots on here, and uh, you can read the values directly off of here. And depending on the plot you choose, you can get reflected pressure, incident pressure, reflected impulse, uh, incident impulse or time of arrival, uh, wavelength, um, velocity of the shock front of the, at the point of interest. But essentially, you take the standoff, divide it by the cubit of the charge weight to determine that Z. That gives you, in this case, 8.14. I read this, uh, 8.14 down at the bottom, and I go up to the curve of interest if it's uh, uh, incident uh, pressure. I go to that dash magenta curve. I go over here and I read off a value of 14, which is 14 PSI. And that's what the, the um, uh, legend on this uh, set of curves tell you. Likewise for incident impulse and other values that may be of interest to you. Okay, thank you, Kirk. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have today for questions. If we did not get to your question, we will work with Kirk to respond to you by email.